people way to worship, to begin our worship service, and just a, a beautiful testimony to anybody who can share those words. It will change your life, absolutely. It will change your life. This will change your life, too, as the Saint Word Choir shares this message with us today. Good morning, and welcome to Mount Carmel Baptist Church. The worship choir is going to share the anthem, You Say Who I Am, um, this morning, and the words will be displayed on the overhead, and we would love for you to sing along with us. interest and we always put people's well-being uh, as a priority and with the events of our community yesterday uh, 
ongoing discussion through the day about what we would do, and I'll tell you how close it came to being canceled. I called Debbie and said, put the message on Global Connect that we won't have service tomorrow. And by the time I finished the conversation with her, the phone was ringing. Someone said an arrest has been made. Called Debbie back and said, cancel that call. <laughs> we, uh, we will be having service tomorrow. But it was not an easy decision, but we will not put people of church at risk. Uh, we will always think about your well-being and pray we'll never face that again. Uh, there will be other times, weather being one of them, snow, uh, <laughs> whatever it may be, but we'll always uh, put uh, your well-being as a priority. And that points out something else. It is absolutely essential for you to let Debbie Melton know contact information, preferably email, but if not a phone number, uh, and Debbie, would you stand so everybody will know this is the one you need to talk to. And uh, because part of the conversation last night was what do we do about the ones who are not on Global Connect? And so please get that information to Debbie. And uh, so when we do put out a message, whatever it may be, to be sure that everyone in the church family will get it. We are rejoicing this morning that we can worship. We are honored to be here. The Lord has invited us here. He obviously has something special planned today. And I know that it's up to each individual to come with your heart and mind and spirit prepared to receive what the Lord has for you. And if you do that, you won't go away disappointed. You absolutely will not. The Lord will meet you here. He's invited you here. You're not here by... Uh, anything but the providence of God. He led you this morning to be here, and that means he's got something special for you today. Wasn't here last week, won't be here next week. It's just for today. Well, there'll be something next week, but not the same thing. So with that in mind, we'll dismiss our children for their worship time, and we ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 4. And we'll be making reference to a number of verses this morning besides the ones we read. But these are uh, focal verses this morning from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 25 through 27. Stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. So we're just getting in a conversation. She went and came into the man of God, to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass, when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shumanite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say to her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God, to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Our Father, we know that on any given day, our emotions uh, become a part of our life. They always are. God created us that way. We know that our human nature is, we were born with it, and it will be a part of us as long as we live. But we also know that we have a spiritual nature, and that too will be with us until the Lord takes us home. So thank you this morning that we can come and just to see ourselves as God sees us and to have a deeper and better understanding uh, why we do <clears throat> the things we do, why we say the things we say, why we on occasions act in a manner that is not Christ-like. Father, we thank you today that we can be open and honest before you because you know our lives inside out. And we would not tell you anything today that you do not already know, but you will tell us something that we do not already know. And so thank you that we can come and 
Just open this word, more importantly, open our hearts and let the two together work as God speaks to us and impart to us a spiritual truth that we need in order to live our life in a manner that will glorify our Lord. Above all prayers, we would pray this morning for anyone who doesn't know the Lord is our Savior. We never come assuming everybody is a Christian. Everybody has trusted Christ. To the contrary, we assume that there's someone who has not. And if we do that, we'll never make a mistake of overlooking uh, the opportunity and the invitation for somebody to give their heart to Christ. So we're praying that the Lord will use every part and every person in this service to glorify Christ's precious and loving name. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Remain standing if you would. And Hazel comes to lead us in our course of praise this morning. Without him. and the light.
Father, we know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the light that a dark world needs. Thank you, Father, that we have seen that light. We have become, what Jesus said, the light of the world. We know that we can only be the light of the world as Jesus Christ becomes the light of our life. There are many people who are still waiting, who are still in the dark. And we know that only the light of God's love will ever change where they are or will ever change them. So we're honored this morning to be a part of the Lord's work. We're honored to be here to worship. What a privilege it is. Sometimes we don't realize that until we are about to lose it. So thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the honor of worshiping you and everything that we say and do this morning. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
anytime we sing that song is usually someone who does what Sherry just did and let's get that real high note at the end. I can only imagine what would happen to the veins in my neck if I tried to do that. I, I just, uh, I can only imagine what would happen to the veins in your neck if I tried to do that. It would not be, it would not be pretty. Uh, thank you for beautiful message it really is. Uh, God is so faithful, is he not? Always uh, great is his faithfulness. From the moment we are born, we have a human nature. And it stays with us as long as we live. It does not take very long for that human nature to kick in gear. An infant baby will do it just as soon as he or she is able to say, me, my, my. The human nature is selfish by nature, not to mention some other thing. So we have that nature with us throughout our lifetime. That's from the moment we are born. For from the moment we are born again, we have another nature, the divine nature. It is the Spirit of God who comes into us, lives in our hearts. And that divine nature is so beautiful when he is at work. It's not a it, it's a he. Because the scripture says that it is in him that we live and move and have our being from day to day. And so we are to work out what God works in. The interesting thing is, and probably not surprising to you, there is usually a confrontation between those two battles. As believers, it's our responsibility to let the spiritual nature have priority. Indeed, the scripture says to have preeminence, to be number one. But the old nature, the human nature, doesn't go down without a fight. The whole nature doesn't die easily. As a matter of fact, the old nature doesn't die at all. The two of them are butting heads. And there are going to be times in our lives when we are going to in a moment, for whatever reason, make a witness to the world about which one of our natures is reigning supreme in our life. And it's a matter of choice. Now, to be sure, we can blame other people, we can blame circumstances, blame who, whatever we want. But when it's all said and done, it's our responsibility, it's on us, it's our choice. In the scripture, in this chapter, there are two women. Could just as well have been men. I'm not picking on women. You know me better to know I do that. After all, I'm 77 years old, and you don't get to be that old by doing things foolish like that. And so I just want to tell you, there are two accounts in this chapter, two different women who exercised Two different spirits, two different natures. The first one is a lady who apparently was angry with God because her husband had died. It's interesting because you can blame whatever and whomever you like about your conduct or your actions in life. But you have to remember something. The Christian life isn't so much how we act as it is how we react. If everything goes perfectly well during the day, we can be Christ-like with no problem. But when things start to go bad, when things start to turn sour, then we have to decide, how am I going to react to this? I know that there are people who say, don't even speak to me until I've had my morning coffee. And you may be one of those, and that's okay. But I'm here today to tell you, with all the love I've got in my heart, that it's going to take more than a cup of joe to get your attitude what it should be when something happens that's going to put your attitude to the test, that's going to challenge you. The first one, Scripture says, was 
lady who told Elisha, the man of God, and by the way, she's nailing it down. She's driving it home. She's getting her point across. She said, thy servant, my husband, is dead. And this man, thy servant, my husband, feared God. You can just tell that she's angry. And verbally, she is punching Elisha. She's letting him have it. And she said, not only that, that's not bad enough. You want a pity party? I'll give you a pity party. The creditors are coming to take my sons in order to, and they're going to make them bondmen. That, by the way, was legitimate at that time. They could take a person's son as payment for their debt, and they did not have to release them until the year of Jubilee. And so she had, in her mind, reason to be angry. And she didn't waste any time letting Elisha know about it. And maybe out of a sense of frustration, Elisha said, what do you want me to do about it? Why are you telling me all of this? And right on the heels of that question, he tells her to, he asks her a question. What do you have in your house? And you can just hear the contention in a voice when she says, I don't have anything but just a little vial of oil. That's all I've got in the house, a little vial of oil. And not only that, she says, I don't have anything. Listen, you see the, you, the tone of the voice? Can you see her eyes? Can you hear her shake, feel her shaking? Can you tell how upset she is? He said, okay, tell you what you do. You send your sons out in the neighborhood and gather up all the empty vessels you can find. And when you come in, you shut the door and you pour the oil into one of those vessels. That seems like about the worst piece of advice you'll ever hear in the Bible. The lady says, I don't have any oil, anything but this little bit of oil. And Elisha says, go around to your neighbor, send your boys around to the neighbor and tell them to gather up all the empty vessels. You know what? That's her problem. That's all she has is empty vessels. I don't know if this will help you, but let me just use this as an illustration. I don't use a lot of sugar, but if I needed some and were to run out and not have any, I'd just make a trip on over to Sherry's house and tell her, listen, we don't have any sugar in the house. And she, being the loving daughter that she is, would say, no problem, Dad. I've got sugar. I'll give you a bowl full. I don't want a bowl full. I want an empty bowl. Well, I thought an empty bowl is what you have in your hand. Why do you want? No, I want an empty bowl. And I, just give me an empty bowl, and God will fill it some way or another. Listen, Scripture says that she went in the room with her sons, and at the advice of Elisha, closed the door and started pouring the oil into the empty vessels. And they did another and another and another until the last vessel was full. And she told her son, give me another vessel. And they said, there are no more. The scripture says the oil stayed. As long as there is an empty vessel, God has an oil to fill it. All he wants from us is to bring to him our lives, which really is an empty vessel. So she started out with a contentious spirit. I don't know, I would like to think, that she came back to Elisha with a grateful heart in the spirit of contrition, for as she started out in the spirit of contention, and said to him, I'm so sorry for the attitude. I'm so sorry for the way I spoke to you. I just apologize for the way I acted, but I don't hear any of that. She did come back and say to him, the oil has stopped flowing, the vessels are full. And he said, go and sell the oil, pay off your debt, and live on the rest. Be a good steward. Then comes another beauty, another woman of Shunammite, 
the scripture says, Elisha would make this journey every day by her house. She and her husband would watch him. And one day she was touched with compassion. She doesn't start out with a contentious spirit. She starts out with the courteous spirit, with a contagious spirit, because love is contagious. He comes by and she is touched by this man of God. She's attracted to him, spiritually speaking. She really is. So she invites him to come in and have a meal. And then, apparently, Elisha makes this trip every day by her house. And every day she invites him to come in and have a meal. And I'm so glad, by the way, the scripture says she and her husband. Because I can tell you, the tail waggers, the tongue waggers, would have a field day if she were to invite the man of God in her house and there was not already a man in the house. So she invites him into her house. And then one day she said, you know what? Why bother for you to make this journey every day? Why don't we just build a little room, fix a little place for you up here where you can just have your living quarters right here. That's what they did. And the scripture says they fully furnished that room. Let me tell you, I don't know what furniture you have in your house. I don't need to know. But I'm telling you, if you have four items in your house, if you have four items in your room, you have a house, a room that is fully furnished. She put a bed, a table, a chair, and a candle. That's all you need. A place to eat, a place to sit, a place to sleep, and a light to read and to study by. A room fully furnished. And then the scripture says, Elisha was touched by all of this compassion. He thought, this is great. And so, already she's got a gracious spirit. She do, cannot do enough for this man of God who comes by every day. Give him a meal. Give him a room. Give him a place to stay. Then the scripture says, in verse 13, Elisha is touched by her generosity. And he says to her, what can I do for you? You have been so good to me. What can I do for you? And listen to this spirit of contention. She said, I dwell among my own people. In other words, all of a sudden, that generous, gracious spirit has turned testy, has turned defiant. And she has this attitude I'm self-sufficient. I'm doing for you. Nobody needs to do for me. When she said, I dwell among mine own people, she really was saying, I don't need anything. I don't need anything you have. Boy, the, how human nature sometimes can just be so easily offended and so easily insulted. She could have said a number of things that would have been more respectful and so then Elisha and his servant Gehazi get in a conversation. And what can we do for her? We want to do something for her. And God bless Gehazi. I don't know where he came up with this, but, and I don't know why he said it. But he said she doesn't have any children, and her husband is an old man. I don't know what he thought was going to happen with that. And so, Elisha says, call her. And when she came to the door, Elisha says, about this time next year, you're going to have a son. Friend, I'm going to tell you what. I'm not opposed to telling anybody anything that God wants me to tell them. But I'm telling you, I'm not going to be the one to break the news to any woman in this congregation that you're going to have a child this time next year. Listen, I know where to stop and I know where to cut, where to get off. And make no mistake about it, you let, you'll figure that out by yourself. You're not going to get me in that one. I can tell you now. Make no mistake about it. And her response was just about as tested because the scripture says she told him, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie to me. In other words, don't promise me something you can't deliver. And he just didn't promise something he couldn't deliver. But here's this, here's this attitude. And so, according to the man of God, 
she had a child. Fast forward about 13 years because it would be about that time when the young man was old enough to go into the field and help his father with the reaping. Out there one day, he has a heat stroke. The best we can figure, that's what happened. He cried, my head, my head. The father, and by the way, this would be a great Father's Day sermon, and maybe you'll get it. But try to forget it between now and then, because I don't want you to act like you ever heard it before. The father told a servant, take him to his mother. How about that for compassion? The young man has had a heat stroke, and all dad can say is to a servant, take him to his mother. Listen, that's laying the groundwork for contention between the man and his wife. And so they take the young lad up to his mother. It apparently was in the morning because the scripture says at noon that child died. She sends to her husband and said, I want you to send me a donkey and a servant and I'm going to go to the man of God and I will be back. And he says to her, why are you going to the man of God? It's not the new moon. It's not the Sabbath. Why are you doing that? And listen to this. In verse 23, she said, he said, it is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, it shall be well. You know, in the husband and wife picture of things, sometimes things can get a little bit testy, can they not? And he sends to her the young man who's just had a heat stroke. The child dies, and she sends back to him a message. Send me a donkey and a servant. And he sends back to her, she says, I'm going to see the man of God. Well, why are you going to see him? It's not the new moon and it's not the Sabbath. And she said, it shall be well. In wife language, that means never mind. That's exactly what she told him. You didn't care enough a while ago. Don't worry about it now. And so in verse 24, she told her servant, this is what she told him, and this is Peyton's interpretation of the scripture. But it's, it's accurate, I'm telling you. She told that servant, you pin that donkey's ears back, you kick him in overdrive, and don't you slow down. Don't worry about my comfort. Don't worry, I'll hang on. You just go as fast as you can go. And the scripture said, when they got in sight of Elisha and his servant, he looked up and sees her coming. He recognized her from the time he spent in a home. He said, that's that woman, that's that Shumanite. And he said, I want you to run, meet her, and ask her three questions. Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? And is it well with your child? And she said, it is well. Three questions, one answer, and one big lie. When, she asked, when they asked her, is it well with your husband? <laughs> Let me tell you what, that man back at the farm could not be any more in the doghouse than he really is right now. I, she doesn't know anything about him. They haven't had any face-to-face -face conversation. They haven't seen each other. They haven't talked to each other. Everything they have done has been through somebody else. Has, they've been talking through somebody else. And she asked, is it well with you? Let me tell you, it wasn't well with her. Nothing was well with her right then. She was in a bad way. She was in a bad mood. And somebody is going to pay. Make no mistake about it. And then she lied above all lies when they asked the question, is it well 
with your child. And she had the nerve to say, it is well when the child had died. Three questions. And she lied in the answer to every one of them. They go on to Elisha. And the scripture says when she comes to him, she caught him around the feet. She wrapped him up around the ankles. And she said, did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, don't deceive me? In other words, I would rather not have had a child at all than to have one and lose it. Why did you do this to me? Why did you do this? Can you see the emotion? Can you see the tension? Can you see the anger? Can you see all of that human nature coming to the surface and welling up and grabbing hold of him around the ankle? And the scripture says that his servant tried to pull her away from Elisha. And God bless Elisha when he said, listen, God hath hid this from me. I didn't know all of this was going on. And so he tells his servant, I want you to go up to the house. I want you to take my staff, and when you go get there, I want you to go in, and I want you to use the staff and bring this child back to life. It's another story, another sermon for another day, but Gehazi was not successful. And the scripture says, by the way, when the servant ran ahead to do what Elisha told him to do, she told Elisha, you are not going to get out of my sight. I'm going with you. Wherever you go, I'm going. And the scripture says when they got there, when they arrived at the house, Elisha found out that the young child had not been revived. He put everybody else, went in the room, shut the door. The scripture says he laid on that child. He got up, went out of the room, went back and did the same thing again. And the scripture says the child sneezed seven times. I have to tell you, some of you know this, every day I will have a sneezing fit. I sneeze four times. I don't know if that means I'm only half alive, half alive because he sneezed seven times and he came to life. But nonetheless, sometimes I get busy in the morning, I don't have time to do it, I don't sneeze till the afternoon. But sometime during the day, I'm going to sneeze. That's just the way it is. You don't need to worry now. I'm saying you're okay right there on the front row. And I, at least uh, you don't have to worry. It's not going to happen just now that I know of. But I'm going to tell you. The scripture says, in the end, she went from a contentious spirit to a contrite spirit. She came to thank the man of God for what he had done. But all oh, the emotions, by this time, she must be thinking, what a week this has been. I don't know how much time had elapsed, maybe not that long, but it was enough to know that in the scripture, in this story, there were two women, one who started out with a contentious spirit, and I would like to think she wound up with a gracious spirit. But she thanked Elisha for multiplying that oil and giving her the means whereby she could pay off her debt and have enough to live on and not lose her son to bondage. But then I'd like to think also that the woman of Shuman was one who started out with such a gracious spirit, but boy, did that go south in a hurry. You see, it really does happen. It really does happen. In our lives, things have a way of changing around us. Our emotions can be all over the place. Our attitude can change. The tone of our voice, our conduct among other people. Some time ago, I had a part in a funeral. And I made the statement in the funeral that the person about whom had 
gone to be with the Lord, I said, I never saw them, never saw them angry. Never saw them angry. Sometime in the week following, somebody commented to me about the service. And they said, you made one mistake. Well, I'm just glad to know I didn't make but one. That's a good day if you're not, I don't make one mistake. But what was it? That you said you'd never seen them angry. And he kind of smiled and he said, I have. I said, no, I didn't make a mistake. I said, I've never seen them angry. If you have, that's on you. But I'm telling you what I have seen and what I haven't. And so that, I will tell you, is a rarity. That is the exception. Because most of us, and I'll just throw my name in the pot for comfort's sake. You know, what I like about guilt, I like corporate guilt. I like it when we're all in it together. I don't like this me and thee. We're all in it together. And so I just want to tell you, there are going to be times in our lives when we are going to be back to the wall and when somebody is going to say something, something's going to happen. Our day is going to start out bad. The tire goes flat or the coffee is bitter or whatever it may be. I don't know. But all of a sudden, what started out to be a good day and us having a great attitude now has really gone south. All of a sudden, we've got to pull ourselves together, pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Give me the grace to be a witness for you today. Give me the grace to be courteous and not contentious. The choice is ours. And please know this right from the beginning. There are going to be times. There are going to be people. There are going to be things that will happen that will make you want to just take somebody to pieces. That's just the way it is. But you can't do that. You can't do that. The human nature and the spiritual nature are going to do this. You've got to decide which one is going to get the upper hand and which one the people of the world are going to see in you. And so two women who started out, and make no mistake about it, we could just as well have talked about men, but I'm so thankful that they came to the place in their life of being gracious and just recognizing the man of God can do only what the man of God can do. The rest is up to the Lord, and a great deal of it is our responsibility. Ask our worship leaders to come as we prepare for our invitation. And that invitation this morning is in is number 412. The Savior is waiting. our invitation today. You know that we live in a time that's really just different. People are well, they're stressed or whatever it is, angry or whatever. Uh, tempers are short. They really are. We, we have now what we never just had before, and that's road rage. It's just, wherever you go, people have no patience, they have no tolerance whatsoever. When I go home from here, a couple ways I go, but I just kind of enjoy going through the back road. Sometimes I don't get in a hurry. If you see me on Elk Run Road, I can tell you, I'll be running 45 miles an hour. So if you're in a hurry, you do what you want to do, but I'm not going to run any faster than that. I just don't do it. I just enjoy going through the back roads down here, whichever, right out through here, go down Gold Mine Road, come out, but about a month or two ago, going through here, and it's kind of a rough road, 
Uh, it's, it's crooked. And I'm going down to the bottom of the hill, up to the top, and around the curve. And before I know, somebody is sitting right on my bumper. I have no idea where they came from. I never didn't see them. And I'm up at the top of the hill going around the curve. And I look back, and there's no, it doesn't look like any distance between my rear bump and their front bump. And I thought, I'm not going to slow down, uh, although that thought does occur once in a while. I'm not going to speed up either. I'm going to drive the way I drive, and no matter what. Lo and behold, I don't know what his problem was. I'm not real sure if it was a man or woman, to be honest with you. It happened so fast. He came around and cut me off. I mean, just flat cut me off. His problem was, her problem was, they were so busy trying to cut me off they didn't see the deputy that was sitting at the stop at the crossroads. <laughs> I wouldn't wish anybody bad luck. You know, I, you know I wouldn't. But thank you, Lord, for small favors, right? right. I, but I'm thinking this is crazy. On a secondary road <laughs> like this, and what is your problem? <laughs> If I did something, I would tell you. I, would say, I had no idea what the problem was, but he clearly, I mean, was determined to put me in the ditch, or worse. And so, me being the curiosity type that I am, I had no choice but to follow and see what happened. And all I can tell you is, when I last saw him, he and the deputy were having a conversation. I don't know what happened after that, but I'm telling you, there's things happening every day that can put your testimony to the, to the test, that can put your testimony for Jesus Christ on the line. And human nature being what it is, yeah, we want to go back. We want to get them. We want to get them. And that's what Steve Freeman said. God says, pray for your enemy. Steve said, I do. God, get them. That's what I pray. <laughs> and so, listen, there's just times when we, want, when we want payback. We want to see God work on them. We want to see God work them over. But that's not what it's about. We have a spiritual nature that just needs to pray. We have a spiritual nature that just has to take the high road. We have to maintain our witness for Jesus Christ because we never know Paul said this, I don't have a problem eating meat that's been offered to idols. He said, I know there's only one God, but I'm afraid there's somebody else over here that says, oh, look at Paul, look at Paul. He's not as big on that one God business as he talks about. He said, I don't want to be a stumbling block to somebody else. That's where the danger is. That's where the danger is. When people think it's okay to be what the unsaved people are, to be what we were before we became a Christian, and so this morning, I just want to tell you, Jesus Christ makes all the difference. Jesus Christ is the difference. He really is. He is the difference. He just doesn't make it. He is the difference. Jesus Christ doesn't give us peace. He is our peace. He doesn't give us wisdom. He is our wisdom. He doesn't give us strength. He is our strength. This morning, the Savior is waiting. For anyone who's never trusted Christ as a Savior, he's standing right here this morning waiting for you. He wants you to come and invite him into your heart. You do it right where you are. This is just making a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior of waiting. And by the way, what you do, do quickly. There are only two verses in the song, <laughs> so you're going to have to get moving. And would you do that as we stand and as we sing? We stand.
Debbie was diagnosed with cancer about a year and a half ago. Everybody here is praying for her, and her name has been in the, on the board up front. And I want to thank everyone for all their prayers. She's here with us today, and she's free of cancer. Praise God. <laughs> Just one note, if the Lord leads in the direction I believe he is now, next Sunday, the message will really be for anyone who has or is going through a difficult and challenging time in their life. Uh, that's all I can tell you, and just uh, you need to be present, and the Lord may change, but this has kind of been in the making for a few weeks and uh, the timing of it, uh, it looks like it will be next Sunday. And so I invite you, I challenge you, and encourage you to invite others who so many people, in that, not just in our church family, but are going through a difficult time. And next Sunday, I pray that the message that God has will be a message that will really comfort and strengthen and encourage you in your walk. Father, today, thank you for the scripture that we have read, the testimony that we have heard. We know that God is at work. We also know that God doesn't heal every individual. So we're thankful for those that he does. We pray for all those, everyone, whatever the outcome may be. Lord, we look to you in this hour Thank you that we do have a divine nature. We have a spirit living in us, the spirit of our Lord. And we have the opportunity, the privilege, and the honor of being a testimony for the Lord. And we realize how quickly that old nature can just challenge us and demand uh, the preeminence, the priority. So thank you, Father, for giving us grace in order that the Spirit of the Lord, that divine nature, will always be victorious and our testimony will be strong for Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <laughs> services today. Keep in mind, we had to make a decision based on where things were at that point. 
he made a lot of calls to different ones in the church. And we're just trying to come up with the best decision we could. If you had a printout of his phone calls yesterday, it would be a long list, I can tell you that. And so I just want to say to Jimmy, thank you for uh, your concern uh, about the church family and making the calls, making the contacts. And I don't know how many times he called me, I called him. Uh, he was probably getting tired of hearing my voice. He was probably getting tired of seeing my face. Uh, I don't, he wouldn't do that, would he? Uh, but anyhow, we, I just want to thank him for his uh, diligence. And so with that in mind, we dismiss today. And what else can we say? It has been good to be in the house of the Lord. It has been good to be in the house of the Lord.